last and exciting to be here to hear the Rick Bendy readers. Woo! And so um, there are chairs up here. There are chairs kind of interspersed. We can get more chairs out. Tim, do you mind? If, no, is that it? Okay. So um, it's standing room only once again at Helicon West. We doubled our audience and we're still standing. So it's going to be a great night. Um, we want to thank everyone for being here. And we want to remind you that Helicon West is done after tonight for this spring season of 2014. We're going to have summer Helicon West. Aaron and some others are in charge of summer. And we'll have it down at the Logan Library. Our friends, the Logan Library partners, Joseph Anderson is here tonight. They're always so good to let us have a room. It's going to be at the Bonneville Room, the next telecon, on May 22nd at 7.30. So if you have things you want to read, that will be the place for it. 6 o'clock until 7.30, Aaron? Okay, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock. I'll have to fix that on my announcement that I sent out by the email. You should never trust me on email until I've sent it two or three times. <laughs> so um, tonight we're going to have the Scribendi readers, the winners of the creative writing contest. And we just want to give a shout out to Marina Hall, who sort of started the first Scribendi <laughs> magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to the uh, USU Library and the catering, USU Catering. There's coffee decaf, hot water for tea, there's cold water, there's treats back there, so dive in. Um, there are three chairs up here, you people standing in the back, and you can also come and sit on the floor up in the front too, if you want to get comfortable. There's a chair over here, some right here. Just don't block this camera. And I wanted to remind the Scribendi readers tonight that you are being videoed, as always at Helicon West, we do a video and we post it on YouTube. So people can see you. If you do not want that posted on YouTube, you need to tell me. I'll be sitting right there. I have the red shirt on my black jacket. It's right there. And if you don't want that, then you can tell me. But believe me, we've had people who have not been videoed before, and they've been very sad about it in the end. So just keep that in mind. All right. Dr. Charles Waugh is our creative writing contest person. He's been doing this for a while. He's great at it. You're going to have a blast listening to him. He's going to um, hook this little microphone on. And let's go, Charles. Woo! <laughs> turn this off. They can clip it on. So. Mm -hmm. Or they can just hold it. Either way. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Apparently, it's on. <laughs> so, thank you all for being here. Scurbendi Night at Helicon. How awesome is that, right? Yeah! We've got a brand new magazine out. It's full of awesome stuff. It's uh, on, on sale in the back for $10. If you got exactly $10, you are in our good graces. If you have uh, things that need change, we are appreciate you buying it. But um, maybe you could help us out by going to the cafe and getting all of their change. That would help us out too. Um, so uh, I wanted to start by uh, saying some thank yous. Um, the first thank you goes, of course, to Star because uh, she has so willingly allowed for the USU Creative Writing Contest to take over Helicon for one night, and uh, it's always so nice for us to be able to showcase our student um, winners uh, at Helicon and to have such a great event to just sort of come into. And uh, just for all year long, a Star putting together Helicon West um, twice a month and just always providing that energy and all that good, um, all that good energy, all that positive energy. So let's give a big round of applause for Star. So our uh, the, my next uh, in long, my long list of people to thank uh, comes from the contest sponsors. Uh, of course, the English department has a huge part in that. Uh, the College of Humanities um, and Social Sciences has a large part in that. Uh, the Writing Center, of which Star again is of another um, one of our great beneficiaries. Um, Helicon West, like I just said, 
Uh, Crumb Brothers Bakery every year um, provides some um, gift certificates for our judges just to say just a little thank you for the, the, all the time that they put into um, uh, judging the contest. Uh, and of course, the uh, Utah State University Student Association, uh, the new, for those of you who are still old school and think it's ASUSU, it's no longer ASUSU, it is USUSA. <laughs> so go USUSA. Thank you so much uh, to um, our student uh, body government for providing the funds to make this happen. They, they, you know, this is uh, coming out of the student pockets. Um, and then this, this, the student government has to decide how to allocate this stuff. And we are so lucky every year that they support uh, the production of the magazine and the running of the contest. Uh, we couldn't make it look this awesome without those dollars. So uh, the next time you see your uh, arts and lectures director or your uh, US USA student senator, uh, give them a little pat on the back and say thank you and encourage them to continue to support us. Um, so I would also like to thank our judges uh, who have put in tons of their time uh, at a very busy time in the semester to read all of the many, many submissions that we had. Um, we had 165 submissions this year um, from seven colleges, which is almost all of the college, colleges on campus. That means that uh, this really is the university's creative writing and art contest. We're pulling people from all over campus. Everybody gets a chance to participate. Everybody gets a chance to come. Everybody gets a chance to listen. Um, everybody gets the chance to stand uh, and be judged just like everyone else. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a great thing that unites our entire campus. Um, our judges this year um, were Joseph Anderson, Shannon Ballum, Russ Beck, Elizabeth Benson, Paul Crumley, uh, Ben Gunsberg, Susan Pesty Strobel, Paige Smitten, and Chad Van Zanten. Uh, let's give them a nice uh, round of applause. Without them, it would probably just be me picking stuff out of a barrel or something, and that wouldn't be any good. So this way we really ensure that the best work rises to the top. And uh, it's so great to have such great work in Scribendi and in the contest. Um, tonight, we are uh, going to... we. This is the first time that it went since I've directed the contest that every single person who won said, yes, I want to come to Helicon West and read. And that's awesome for us, but it also means that we've got to work through a lot of material tonight. Um, every, we've had to decide how to uh, allocate time. Uh, Star has very graciously given up the open mic portion to us this night, which never happens. You could bring in, you could bring in, you could bring in like the top earning Poet in America, which you know, okay, top earning poet. Okay. <laughs> you could bring in, you could bring in a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, and that person would not get the full time at Helicon West. Uh, they have to make room for open mic. But Star has so graciously allowed for us to do that because all of our writers wanted to meet tonight, and we wanted to give uh, everybody a chance to just give you a little bit of their winning work for tonight. So. Um, we have arranged a program with them in advance. Um, we have given uh, short amounts of time, which they're all supposed to be aware of and have practiced for. Um, you've all done that, right? <laughs> no laughing, that was not the answer. <laughs> yes, we practiced. It's only five minutes, I promise. Um, some of our winners will be speaking longer than others because some of them actually won in more than one category. So for example, um, one of our first group of read, uh, readers will be Caitlin Erickson who won for uh, first uh, place in nonfiction and second place in poetry. So we're going to give her a little bit more time. Um, uh, and there's a couple others like that and I'll, I'll mention them as, as I get there. Um, but that's the general um, that's the general outlay. I'm going to introduce these folks in one second. Um, what we should be seeing in the background here are some of the winning uh, artworks. Uh, this piece here is by Wan Jun Han. Um, it's the first place winner. It's the piece that's featured on the cover. Uh, it's called Frozen. And I, honestly, you know, lights? what's that? Turn the lights. Well, I want the. What do you think, guys? I, I mean, I want you to be able to see the speaker, too, and I want them to be able to read with light. Um, <laughs> so it's not the best, but you know what? The Really the best way to check out the artwork? Right there. 
ten dollars in the back of the room is the best ten bucks you ever spend. All that money that gets goes, goes into these magazines goes right into the co the contest funds, and we just put that into making new copies for next year. So it just it just means that if you buy a copy tonight, then what you're actually doing is you're probably you're buying a, a copy for somebody for next year. So that's a good thing. Not that you know they would get a free copy because you paid for one or something. <laughs> Our winners do get free copies, and the judges get copies. So you know you're. You're buying a winner a copy if you do that. <laughs> okay, so uh, do please check these out. And one of the nice things about the magazine is that, you know, we do have these great color photographs in here. It looks fantastic. Um, and that brings me to the last group of people that I have to thank before we can get started. And um, that is the interns for this year. Um, the interns have been fantastic. Uh, they help to um, sort all of the entries when they come in. Before that, they're out making posters and putting them up, promoting the contest, getting people to follow us on Facebook, getting people to follow us uh, wherever they can, going out to Pobev and other, to Helicon West, trying to get people interested, excited, and hooked into the network of people who are following contests so that we can get information out to them. Um, they have, uh, they're making presentations to USUSA to get funding for more, um, for more contest money for next year. They have produced this magazine, they've copy edited this magazine, they've worked with the winners, they've, they've got the thing ready to go, and then they've laid this out with tons and tons of work. And I don't know if, uh, if anyone's checked this out yet or not, but one of our pieces is this uh, really awesome piece of nonfiction. It's the first place undergrad nonfiction winning piece by Crystal Henderson. And it's got this, you know, part of it is that it's got this, uh, you know, there's, a, there's like a visual element to it, right? And, uh, you know, Allie Madden was our intern. She worked tirelessly to make this actually happen. Maybe this doesn't look hard to you, but when you're laying these things out in InDesign, this means hard work. And then when you have to change something on this page over here, because something wasn't right, and then you realize later, oh, now this is all messed up again. You have to do it again. She did it like eight times. You know, so so she um, she was a real trooper. She made this thing happen, and um, all of our interns they worked so hard to make this happen. Can we please have Caitlin and uh, Caitlin Erickson, Shay Larson, and Allie Madden come on up and just uh, could you guys all just please help me to thank them with a round of applause for all the. <laughs> Fabulous wrapping job, but as you can see, this is <laughs> University Bookstore. <laughs> um, thanks to all three of you. Fantastic job, fantastic magazine. We're so excited to have it. All right, without much further ado, let's get this uh, show on the road. Uh, we'll start tonight with um, our first place winners. Uh, we're going to hear in this order from Kendall Pack, Caitlin Erickson, Tina Sitton, Mitch Hawk. Crystal Henderson, and Stacey Dinetsosi. Uh, that is in order, the, the first group is our uh, first placed graduate winners in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Uh, and then our undergraduate winners in fiction, uh, nonfiction, and poetry. So um, what I would like for each reader to do, when you come up, would you just please, uh, just again, tell everybody who you are, because they're not going to remember, just say your name. And then to say the title of the piece that you're about to read, and uh, just uh, again remind them that it's you know fiction or nonfiction or poetry. I hope everybody's going to get it if it's poetry, but you know sometimes people can't tell the difference between fiction and nonfiction, and that can be scary for people. So <laughs> so let them know if it's true or not. I guess that's what I'm saying. So um, without any further ado, let's hear from Kendall Pack. It's an accessory for you. You're allowed to hold this. Thank you. I'll try both. Okay. Uh, 
Mm, no. Uh, I'm Kendall Pack, uh, first place uh, for graduate fiction. Um, now, I'm only going to be re uh, able to read seven minutes worth anyway, uh, which there's no way I can get through the whole thing. So I figure I'll tell another story first and then give you an even shorter teaser. It's not another story I wrote. No, don't worry, I'm not like, here's some new work. Um, uh, give you a short teaser so that you go buy the book. Speaking of which, I have a $10, no, I have two $10 bills in my pocket. So if you have a 20 and you would like to buy one of those, I'm not joking, ask me and I will give you two 10s so that you can buy the book for just $10. Um, but this, this uh, first story I want to tell is, uh, the day that we were supposed to turn in all of our uh, submissions, several of the graduate students were pretending they were too busy to. And so the day after, uh, or, or like the hour after uh, we were supposed to have turned it in, Charles sent us all this email. Uh, and he said a lot, but the central question of it, the thing that sticks out in my mind is, what the hell? <laughs> we're giving you this opportunity, right? This is an opportunity for you to publish and this is your career, this is what you want to do, so why aren't you publishing? And so we all very sheepishly uh, uh, turned things in. Uh, and then I ended up winning first place. And so then I, you know, with, with my tail between my legs, sent Charles an email and said, thank you for giving me the push to submit to Scribendi. And he sent an email back that simply said, more like a kick in the ass. Um, and so I want to say thank you to Charles and for everyone who puts uh, together Scribendi. Uh, because it's a great opportunity for us who are in the English program and outside of the English program to get published, even here, uh, right here on campus, and know, hey, someone actually wants to read our stuff, and it gives us that boost we need to uh, continue trying to publish. So, uh, and what does that give me? Five minutes now? I think you have three minutes left. Three minutes, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read uh, just a small portion of uh, my piece, Last Lovers on Mars. Daniel, laying in bed beside his wife, Elise, pressed down on the power button on his laptop. The base of it grew warm on his thighs as the screen illuminated the small bedroom. Elise rolled over, pulling the blanket tight between them. Daniel looked at her back, her skin exposed at the neck, pale and freckled. She mumbled something, maybe a call of turn that off or go to sleep, but then she fell silent. He reached over and touched the base of her neck with his fingertip, tracing the islands of freckles, connecting them with the path of his hand. Hold me, she muttered. He moved the computer to his side and put one arm over her. Hair covered her face, long golden strands, and he brushed them aside to kiss her cheek. I'm going to stay up and work a little, is that okay? He asked, caressing her shoulder. She turned, the hair falling away from her face. What are you working on? Just this essay for class, he responded, turning back to the computer and opening the web browser. Which class, she asked. He stared at the screen for a moment, then looked back at her. Oh, just that paper for engineering. Babe, look, Nate has pictures of his stupid baby up. He turned the screen towards her. I thought you were writing, she mumbled. He looked at the back of her head for a moment, wondering where between reality and dream her mind stood. He wondered if the computer on his lap was analogous to the dreams in his head, a fiction presented as reality that he might experience but never exist in. Yeah, sorry, he said, and turned the screen away from her. You and the stranger both like role play. Say hi. Stranger, hello. You, hi. Stranger, ASL. You, 24, male, Texas. Stranger is disconnected. Start a new conversation? You and the stranger both like role play. Stranger, hi. You, hi. Stranger, male or female? You, male. Stranger is disconnected. <laughs> Start a new conversation? In their first three months of marriage, Daniel and Elise Garner engaged in sexual congress an average of two times per day. Their highest number of coital encounters in a single 24-hour period was six, while their lowest was zero. They only missed one day, and it happened to be the day that Elise was sick with the flu, so it hardly counts. <laughs> now, four months into the marriage, they've slowed to a little over once per day on average. This can be attributed to Daniel's work and school schedules, Elise's school schedule, and a waning in the wide-eyed fascination that accompanies inexperienced sexual partners in their first months of experience. Daniel believes that the main reason is a lack of fulfillment on her part, leading to a sense of the fact uh, of the act as purely selfish from him. Elise might agree that sex seems to be an experience meant for the man more than the woman, seeing that she only receives the slightest pleasure, followed by frequent urinary tract infections. <laughs> um, thank you. Buy the book.
you may hold it, you may clip it, you may ignore it, but you have to bellow with that pair. Okay, I will do that. I will clip it. It will allow you to read in a more natural style. <laughs> <laughs> if I can figure out how I can clip it. That does that work? I'll just do this. This will be better. Um, <laughs> That's perfect. So yeah, uh, this is my creative nonfiction piece. It's basically about nature. That's the best thing to do. I'm timing myself because otherwise this will be terrible. Okay. Uh, Colby moved into my school in sixth grade. His hair looked like he spread gel across his palm and then fanned it across his bangs, so it curved across his head like a crown. We traded Harry Potter trivia. We teased each other endlessly. I told everyone I hated him and then wrote fluttering journal entries about him in the lamplight of my bedroom. In junior high, his goofy fi features turned handsome. He became popular. He took up diving and part-time jobs. He took pretty girls to dances. And then, while hiking in Snow Canyon his sophomore year of high school, he took a misstep, fell, and died. Before his last hike, Colby turned to his family and said he was off to bigger and better things. I imagine he tipped his baseball cap at them before turning and striding away. The words, printed in the newspaper five months after his fall, haunted me. I envisioned him trucking through white top canyons, shoes scuffing through red sand. I could see him looking out over a misty landscape, hands furrowed into his hips, breathing southern air laced with juniper and sand deep into his lungs. And then on his way back to camp, a slip, or maybe a crack, and the mangled limbs at the bottom of a hundred foot drop. In my mind, I saw Colby, who never stopped moving, not even in the dead of class, completely still, curled on the ground as though sleeping, blood pooling into a pillow around his head. And then I saw his family, his sister and two little brothers and parents, heavy with grief, haunted by the same words, bigger and better things, a path we couldn't follow. From then on, I hated cliffs and, cliffs and drop offs. Colby hiked all the time. He had good shoes and experience. What chance did I stand? On the requisite family vacation hikes, I hugged the walls, hung onto the rails, placed for hikers' convenience, gasped and clutched at my chest any time I heard traction slip. All I could see while hiking next to ledges was me sailing over as though carried by water, plummeting into paling trees on the Oregon coast or sharp cutting sandstone in the southwest, disappearing forever after one misstep. Okay, and then fast forward to Zion National Park. Um, and then I lost my spot. That's cool. Um, okay, we planned on hiking to the Emerald Pools. The trail was simple, curvy, and steep, but paved. We passed children who only came up to the hem of our shorts and hikers hunched over walkers. Near the trail entrance, we saw a doe posing for photographs a few feet off the path. She stood on a deep incline facing the trail, her pretty face and overstated eyes pointed toward her admiring fans. Her stance looked remarkably like Bambi, and she stayed still despite more and more people gathering to take pictures. I bet the park rangers put, it up, put her up to it, Aiden said, glancing at me sideways. Maybe she gets a cut of the profits because deer care so much about money. Some might. We followed the trail through shaded and sunny areas as we made our way towards Heaps Canyon, where high, sheer walls were rounded, like someone had taken a swipe at it with the scythe. Along the trail, cottonwood trees stuck out at strange angles and diagonals, and I didn't see a single trunk standing straight up and down. Early spring made everything lush and green, a rarity in the desert. The air became cooler as we gained elevation and moved deeper into the U-shaped canyon. As we rounded a corner, I heard a trickling in the distance. As we approached the lower, lower emerald pool, I felt like I stood inside a handmade teapot. The curved walls, streaked poppy red and rust, the color of a wound, came to a sharp circular edge at the top where I imagined a lid could go. As most of the water slipped down the smooth rock rather than cascading over the ledge above, the walls shone like glass pottery after the kiln. The trail followed the natural curve of the formation, and the environment went from serene, green, and well-paved to wet, muddy, and slippery. Water surrounded us. Pebbles clung to the railing separating the hikers from the pool. Thin sheets made its way down the wall, and millions of drops tumbled down from somewhere above us. The ground became slick sandstone like the walls. In other spots, red-orange mud clung to my shoes, squelching with every step. I saw the trail curve along the bowl and go up and out of it, and I saw it unprotected from any type of railing. That's where the trail led, and fear, like a canteen filling water, began to splash in my stomach. 
I clung to the railing, even though my hands ached from cold and my fingers threatened to slip away at any moment, and made my way around the lower pool. It wasn't very deep. I could see the uneven array of large rocks at the bottom. If I fell, I would probably hit them and break my back. There was a guy who came and talked to my fourth grade class who did that. He jumped into Lake Powell and there was a sandbar just skimming beneath the surface of the water. And he was paralyzed from the neck down. I never wanted to go to Lake Powell after that. We reached a portion of the trail where chains drilled into the wall of the bowl replaced the railing. The chain felt just as wet and cold and slippery, but the edge now lay open. There is no rail to brace against, just slick sandstone that can send someone over in seconds. Although my chest felt tight and I kept seeing nothing but blood and broken limbs, I wanted to keep going. I clenched the chain and would not let go, not even to let people pass. I, I pressed myself as close to the cold, water-covered wall as I could, but I would not, could not let go. I climbed higher and higher and began to have some hope that I would be just fine when the chain stopped. The trail became a rough set of muddy sandstone steel upstairs. They were not straight, but rather went up in opposing diagonals. One step tilted toward the pool, another towards the wall. They were uneven, no more than four feet wide, and wet. Mud spread across the stairs like thick frosting. Okay, I'm gonna stop there so I can also read poetry. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read two of my poems, mostly because I can't find the other poem. So, <laughs> you get two of them. Hooray! At least they're both, like, related thematically. That's cool. Okay. Tha. Wait, that's not the one I want. This is the one I want. Okay. <laughs> Rewind. Walking to Tandori after freezing rain. It rained in spurts all day, and drops eased themselves over snow and slick metal of the cars, smoothed into sheets that students skidded and skated across to get to class. The Indian place is a block from my house. I walk there in the dark, breath puffing like cigarette smoke, cleats clinging to my boots. Ice sounds like gravel under my weight. Shards, like frosted glass, pile in corners of parking lots and sidewalks. It's been so cold I forgot the sound of water dripping. Bitter cold, the sting of frost pricks exposed skin in seconds. Now water drips methodical from bare branches, splashing craters onto the ice below thawing like frozen meat. The metal studs attached to my boots clack against the sidewalk where no ice, ice exists to sink into. I wait for my food in a red painted lobby and carry the fragrant back home, walking gingerly as though the ground is a new bruise. Cinnamon, cumin, and cream fill the apartment as I spoon rice and masala into one heavy white bowl. Outside, icicles drip onto the walkway, creating pockmarks of crusted snow. The drops low like a heartbeat in the muffled light. Night. And now, Tha. <laughs> we sit on knotted benches in the steam-soaked rental hut of a small town skating rink, breath, breath puffing steam as we lace worn skates to our feet. College students in faded hoodies and kids in puffed up parkas surround us, fill the air with chatter and condensed breath. Outside the air, dry, cold, cracking, holes bodies close. Our skates glide over ice lacerated with cuts and curls of blades before ours, powdered snow scattering in the breeze. You coax me along, your voice smooth, counteracting the panic notes of mine. Just look a few feet ahead, you say. Look where you want to end up. I wobble toward the goal, an evergreen shaded black in the streetlights. I fear the snap of fractures and the stretch of sprains that come with the inevitable fall. I fear you dragging we are dragging you onto the ragged ice with me, but you skate next to me, matching my erratic glides, our hands laced, fingers frozen. At home, you drip soft wax onto my back as I lay spread across my sheets like Venus of Urbino. It melts ice in my muscles, warmth spreading like steam. You aim wax at my spine. Heat blooms like forget-me-nots. When we sleep, twisted in check sheets, I lay on your chest and listen to your heartbeat pulsing like hers against your ribs. My palm resting on your stomach, thaws. Thank
Maui or as poised, but that's just not going to happen. And this thing. Oh, yeah. I'm Tina. Hey. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be reading poetry and fictions, but first it's going to be poetry. So we don't want to confuse people, right, Charles? Yes, because people get confused. You guys will get confused. I don't know how that. Okay, so first one is poetry. And um, you'll notice the rhyme schemes in doing formal poetry. And you'll hear the refrains in there. So this first one's called El Camino. And El Camino in Spanish means the way. This <coughs> comes from the El Camino de Santiago de Compostela. So it's a, a pilgrimage that people go on. And so just know that that's what El Camino means. El Camino, for my son, James. Come, little pilgrim, pull on your jute sack. I'll find a way for us. God's call, cat's eye, muslin shoes will grind away. Sandstone, old stone, relic bone. Between Alcathars and Ojala Kays, ricocheting soul, sap, stab stone, stamp, and wind their way. Miracles, double miracles, to elicit more miracles. And here sutures the relationship between holy and commercial. Cloth binds both ways. Forget the vomit and the piss and the crushed wine cups on San Fermin streets. Reach low, hear cockles, feel shells. Santiago's scallop shells remind the way. Spanish olives drop under the shade of the Torre de Bartlemé. Outside the hospice, homeless men lie on benches to protest in guitar notes rhymed away. Stories of French sieges, <coughs> secret bodega doors sprung to Ebro's bank, but stories are cotton blossoms padded with silk and seen double-lined anyway. And before the pilgrim's lips graze or profane the psalms, razor cut the palm down the center, see the blushing pulp, and peel the rind away. Did you know that the world divided for you? That Iberia fell for you? That your name took a stone boat to Pedron and climbed away? Does it matter that a field of stars written down in a book, buried under Galatian sand and soot to lead the mines away? But let mother tell you, James, as we walk against the sunflowers, it's a fool's cap across the brow. It's a fool's cap across the brow that blinds the way. Okay, this next one is another hazal, which is similar in form. I can find it. It's called the other side. The other side. Let's break all the pieces, kaleidoscopic traces, with reflectors on the other side. Elysium fields and beaches wait for Andromache's Hector on the other side. I search language after language to find your grammatic placement, just to find, to know what happens to specters on the other side. On a parchment paper map emerges a deadly picture to step through silver Coptic code and leave a negative balance. The image fractures on the other side. I turn out your houndstooth pockets like flagships, sails empty, to scrub, then scrub your fingerprints from cupboard doors. I'm left a recollector on the other side. We can touch the relic races, hard leather faces, if we keep our fingertips white and pure. You and I, in our goodliest of graces, will be the resurrectors for others. Besides, think of the living dead, embrace them. Vibrant ghosts will give us their secrets through lattice windows. Gem glass, red, orange, blue, painted in creases. Words etched there on the other side. The sacred door, knock, knock, a tax echoes in small spaces. Peace be unto you and yours will whisper our lines like actors on the other side of the curtain. We'll climb out through the trap floor, 
Good God, we can even be debt collectors on the other side of the boneyard. We'll play games like we did when we were kids, hide behind the wet headstones. We'd walk out as proper bone inspectors for the others. Side by side, Sister Christina, Brother Ben, we'll count their iron crosses, <coughs> gloat with our pink skin. We can do it all, dear brother, if you just come back here from the other side. Throwing Stones. This is a fiction piece that I wrote. Um, it's about growing up and understanding sin and, I don't know, <clears throat> who we are in the world. As Ima waited in the cool water, her toes kicking up small puffs in the house, she got up enough courage to ask her abuela, If Papa is Basco, does that mean I'm Basco too? Partially, yes, her abuela answered slowly. Are you Basco? No, mijita. Me and your mamá are castellanas. So I'm different from your mamá, Ima asked quickly, still kicking up mineral pus. Not really, her abuela flustered a little. The man who hurt my, Ima shrugged the words away, took a deep breath and continued. The man, he said, he called my papá a maqueto. Am I? Maketo too? Her abuela didn't answer, but her blue eyes became glossy, polished like the water as she stared straight into Ima's large brown eyes before she lowered her gaze to pick up another stone, smoothing it over and over with her plump thumb. Can I tell you the story? She finally asked. Ima nodded her head and had yes, and her grandmother started to tell her her favorite story, the one with the three brothers and the one sister who was secretly a princess. How the sister had saved her brothers from the giant by listening to the old woman and not giving in to her pride. Ima imagined herself in the story, standing in the grand church, ready to marry the prince, and for a moment she'd forgotten the whole thing she saw a few nights before. Her grandmother stopped and called her over. Ima's skin was getting red from the cold water. Her grandmother sat her on her lap, wrapped her skirt around Ima's legs, rubbed the cloth across her skin, then tucked one corner of the hem under her knee to keep it tight. Then she wrapped her arm, her larger arms around Ima's small bare ones. Mijita, she said. I want you to take these pebbles one by one and squeeze them, all the bad memories into them, all the bad thoughts and all the bad things that hurt your heart. And then Abuela threw a pebble into the pool with a hollow clump. You let the river take it. Ima looked at her grandmother. Will they be okay, Abuela? I don't know. I know, my child, but of course they will be okay. Her brother, her Abuela smoothed her dark hair. Do you hate me, Abuela? Her, her abuela whispered as if her breath had been sucked out of her. No, never. No one is mad at you. But why? This is not This is sin, isn't it? I couldn't remember the child's prayer. I didn't know how to confess. I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand up. I was mean. No, this is not your fault. This is not sin, okay? We will go and visit them in the hospital after we leave. It's going to be okay. Vale? Ima nodded, okay. This is how we heal, Mijita. Abuela took another rock in her palm and, like a prayer, let it flit into the river. Thank you. My name is Mitch Hawk, and I got 
real read a story that took first for uh, undergraduate fiction. And I was trying to pay attention to the previous people. I think I might be the first one to swear. So. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Kendall swore twice in his opening remarks. I yeah. just see that. Oh, that's true. <laughs> That was off the cuff. Yours is in print. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> <clears throat> it's titled, The Last Stop for Bus 59. I repeatedly adjusted myself on the plastic blue seat cushion. Well, before I start, I should say, because it's a fiction and I'm going to be weaving in and out, it's a young kid um, in middle school. So, I repeatedly adjusted myself on the plastic blue seat cushion. Butt imprints from strangers were permanently worn into it. A thin piece of plastic, my thrift store jeans, and Spider-Man underwear were all I had to separate me from the cold metal. I took my puffy gray Disneyland winter coat off and folded it underneath me, but quickly returned it to my shaking shoulders. Last year, Carl, our bus driver, promised the heater would be fixed by now. I continued moving every couple of minutes from the aisle seat to the window seat, following the air my tiny frame pushed from one side to the other. I finally gave up on trying to catch the part of the seat with the area's cushion and looked over the messages people had left scribbled on the back of the seat in front of me. They were all the same. The majority were just bad words we weren't supposed to say out loud, like shithead and bastard. On Monday when I sat down on the bus after school there was a new message. No one likes you, jack off, you faggot. I looked in my backpack to see if I could find anything to cover up the black marker, but I was only able to find half a black colored pencil in the pile of pencil shavings and tiny ripped up papers at the bottom. I scribbled over it, but the message was still clear. I heard Tony and the cooler kids laughing at me from the back of the bus. I brought a marker the next day and was able to cover it up better, but it doesn't really matter because I still remember what the black blotch says. I kneeled down on the floor beside the wheel bump and peeked around the corner to get a better view of the back. Tony was the last stop on the bus route, and his friend Riley was with him. Tony was fat, but for some reason I always called it Big Boned. His opposite, Riley, was a twig, only a little bigger than me. Tony looked right at me and barked, What are you looking at, Jack Off? He yelled it too loud, and Carl was able to hear it over the down on the corner out in the street song playing over the speakers. Hey, Tony, come on, man, why do you have to be so mean? No name calling here. Carl said through the speakers. I looked at him over my shoulder and he shot me a wink and a smile. I turned back, facing my seat, and pulled out my drawing notebook that my dad got me for my birthday. The 100 pages were already almost halfway full after only having it for one month. Even though my dad forgot my exact birthday and gave it to me a couple days late, I was happy he remembered what I had asked for. Most of the pages were drawings of different things I imagined I would be doing with my mom if she were still here. We were riding horses, fishing, feeding chickens, and reading at night next to the wood-burning stove in our old house. Whenever I added her to my drawings, I would have to go back and change the quiet, straight-lipped faces of me and my dad. My favorite is of my mom reading my favorite book, Hatchet, by the light of the stove. Father didn't really care too much for reading, but whenever we read Gary Paulson books, he would lean against the wall behind us and listen as mom talked in accents and changed the intensity and softness of her voice with each new scene. Dad thought no one could see him listening, but my mom and I would smile at each other while we saw his reflection in a china cabinet near the front of the room. Looking at this picture, I could almost always concentrate and hear her voice reading the opening story of the plane crash. Then I could close my eyes and listen to her forever. While listening to my mom's quiet and panicky voice, a loud grinding noise exploded from underneath the bus and brought me back to reality. Carl stopped moving his arms frantically and looking at the different dials on the dash. I struggled putting the pencils back in the case, then zipped them shut in my front small pocket of my backpack. Kids, everything's fine, Carl was interrupted by an even louder explosion right underneath me. The weight of the bus shifted and I fell into the side wall, hitting my head hard. The grinding noise was even louder now and I could see out my window thousands of tiny sparks flying around <coughs> the air being extinguished by all the snow on the ground. I imagined a large fireball flying through the deep white snow. Susie's screaming was even louder than the broken bus, and Johnny was holding her tight, trying to calm her down. I was shaking so bad that grabbing my prayer rock from my pants pocket seemed harder than coloring inside the lines. My grandma gave me the tiny rock just a month before she passed away. I finally got a hold of it 
and held it out in my clenched fists. I squeezed my eyes shut and started praying, please save us, God, please save us. The cold air in the bus was quickly tainted with the burnt rubber, but we were still going fast. I peeked one eye open and watched a blur of a tree fly by the window. I covered it again and kept them closed. I could feel the bus started to slide sideways. Something warm was streaming down my head and onto my right cheek. Tony was crying in the back and Riley kept yelling, we're gonna die, his voice was higher than usual. We hit head on into the snowbank. The collision threw me into the back of the seat in front of me and I dropped to the floor. I coughed and blew dust out of the steel ridges on the floor. I slowly sat up into my seat and looked at the large dent my body made in the back of the seat. There was a little bit of dark red blood splattered on the seat I never noticed before. I heard Carl's loud army boots walking down the ribbed metal aisle. Susie's crying changed from yelling to whimpering, and Ryan was trying to calm Tony down. Carl was going outside to look at the engine to find out what was wrong. Johnny ran past me and followed Carl outside. Johnny was always talking about his Hot Wheels collection and couldn't pass up on the opportunity to look at an engine. I watched as Carl tried to refuse him, but he gave in pretty quickly, smiling and putting his arm around Johnny as I went outside. I heard Susie yell, Stop it! I turned around and saw Tony rummaging through her backpack. What's this? Tony asked Susie. Looks like we found something to blow up this weekend, Riley. Tony threw a blonde doll at Riley, who caught it and shoved it in his backpack. Give her back, Susie pleaded. You just sit there and make sure your big brother doesn't find out, Riley said. Tony continued going through her things. I stood up and said, give her doll back. What did you say? Tony asked. Come say it to my face. I sat back down in my seat, scared to face Tony with Carl and Johnny still outside. I looked down at the empty part of the seat and saw my prayer rock shoved between the backrest and buttrest. I pulled it out and knelt up on the seat. Susie was starting to cry and Tony was pretending to kiss another doll on the lips. I held my arm back, please don't hit Susie, and threw it fast into the air. I'll end there. <laughs> And this is the first time I've been standing and have not been in a nightgown for like over a week. So <laughs> if I slip up a few times, I will probably consider that a victory. Um, the title is We Are As Strong As a String, Stuck Inside of an Ice Cube, Stuck Inside of an Iceberg. We Are As On Two Diamonds. Um, and that was taken from a the slam poet, Nis Mochigani his poem Invincible, which I won't take credit for, but I'll take credit for the rest. Junior year of high school, and who can say we are too old for this? The trundle is pulled up to match the height of the bed, and seven girls form the sprawl of a pack across the mattresses. Lissa is to my left, her front facing towards my side. Jess is on my right, our shoulders, hips, and the edges of our feet touching. Kitty perches diagonally at our mingling feet, refusing sleep. Kitty, the essence of feline, stirring the rest of us up. Scary, forceful, hopeful jungle animal in a gymnast body, silky, dramatic pajamas. She's putting my feet to sleep. Katie is curled in a ball next to Jess, listening. She repeats the ends of sentences as the others talk. Finally, you have Emily and Rachel to the far right, both of them with hands clasped over their chests. Rachel's mermaid hair spills onto Emily like a second blanket. We all weave in and out of three conversation threads, heat and stretches, yawns melting over me. All the days and nights we've spent together turn into this night, this dog pile of laughter and half sleep. Melissa captivates Katie and Kitty with the retelling of her first kiss. Caleb's braces caught hers and their lips pulverized. She'd <laughs> swallowed blood. Rachel and Emily convulsed in familiar skittishness at the thought of passion, specifically touching. Katie laughed with them. Katie's been around the hard blocks. She acts like she knows her shit. We believe she does. And I'm still, staring around my childhood bedroom. Soft periwinkle walls with Victorian, tr Victorian trimming are covered in layers of photos, notes, quotes, get well soon cards, 
The top layers chronicle the most recent years. Beneath them, a girlhood spins towards its genesis. I match the faces of these girls in my bed to the height of the wall. Their smiles and scowls, scribbles and notes on the backs of math tests create its texture. I'm throbbing in the exact center of the nucleus of our beast, its brain and pulse. We built this together, this den I slowly close my eyes in. I know all of them will be there, eventually breathing slow and deep, mumbling, farting, kicking ribs, subconsciously negotiating blanket allotment. Come morning, we'll all wake, waiting for everyone to open their eyes before we argue about making waffles or pancakes for breakfast. We've always worried about it changing. We still do. And it does. Jess, Emily, and I are married. Rachel might be close. Alyssa is serving an LDS mission. Katie and Kitty are still looking for boys, usually. Sometimes they are busy in their wild card souls making things with things like working too many hours and getting more and more clever. I sleep next to Alan Henderson now, piled up and tangled into each other, mumbling, farting, kicking ribs, subconsciously negotiating, blanket allotment, in the thinly insulated basement apartment we can hardly afford. We're a different kind of animal, vulnerable and still slightly imbalanced, integrating male and female parts a bit like cubs, a lingering sense of puppy love, always on the edge of something. I am now two animals, young and ancient. I am finding ways to inhabit the skins of both. This is me being a woman, holding the hand of a wolfish girl. This is me being a wolfish girl, steadily squeezing a woman's hand, keeping her wild and vibrant, always on the edge of something. Recently, Katie and I were sitting on a cold curb. Our conversation turned in intricate lines, discussing Rachel's current boyfriend and our continuing desire for cussing and delinquency. We were missing our woman. I poked a pebble with a stray stick and suddenly knew something. Katie. I figured it out, the thread. I've never known what to call it. We're all angry babies, that's what we have in common. I'm charming to almost everyone for some reason. Rachel's a forever genius mystery seahorse. Emily's a lamb herding lambs and a man snatcher. Alyssa is golem crazy and likes human fetuses. Kitty, in the grandest display of depth I've encountered, admits to shallowness, and was a damn talented cheater. Jess is champion of the private life, the baking life, and a hippie child. You are the boulder of hate that everyone pours secrets into, the one that is important and hard and that gave Emily a concussion, but we're all angry babies, and we always talk about sex in the hot tub, and are too smart for our own goods, and we will always read fashion magazines at Walmart and then drive into the mountains. We'll go out and lay in the dirt, we'll snarl and howl, we'll tease each other's husbands, we'll extend blankets and babysitting coupons and ideas and help each other never grow out of our skin. You're exactly right. Angry babies, that's it. We're the ABCDFs, angry baby clan, destined eternal friends. Also, I think everyone on the temple grounds can see up your skirt. <laughs> Shit. I adjust. Katie checks herself. We don't have the best track record with sitting demurely. We wait anxiously for a mutual friend to emerge from the building, husband in tow. Joanna's married. So crazy, right? <laughs> the night before, we devoured hamburgers and prowled through at least three sex shops, all of us dressed in plastic beads and princess crowns. Towards midnight, Joanna started pacing in panic. After some laughter, we had asked her what was wrong. She needed body wax. Now. Walmart. We found a kit. The wax was supposed to smell like coconut. We brought her into the bathroom and warmed up the shower. She undressed and stepped in. My legs are going to be easy enough, but someone is going to have to do the rest. <laughs> Katie looked at me straight away. We both know Crystal is going to be the one who ends up in there. And it was true. <laughs> She needed her ladies that night. <laughs> Hello. 
My name is Stacy Natsosi. Yad F. Shistis in it, so see him she for each eight names, ne? Nakai Bashinchin. Is it Sana Dutch? The Lagana Dutch, not it? That was my, myself introducing myself in Navajo, and that's who I am. So, my first poem is called The Indian Beauty. I saw a picture, framed, in a dear friend's home, admired by all. She was called The Indian Beauty. She was clothed in soft, white, wrinkled buckskin fringe hanging off her breasts and sleeves. Snow cascaded around her, fading out the forest behind. Beads decorated her hair. She had one of those furtive stares. Because that's what we look like. We lie half-clothed on buffalo skins in some seats, <laughs> gift shop or country store, with hands that are ground soft, as if we don't work. As if our callous lifestyles haven't marked us just yet, we are all thin as willows, legs limber as green wood in spring, like we don't eat or cook. In fact, we all have a native lover, or some John Smith. You see us twisted up in a loving embrace, vulnerable and sensuous, barely brown, almost white, white enough to be admired, white enough to be accepted. The flurries speckle out tradition, but when I look into the eyes of my mother, I don't see this. I see hands mangled by arthritis, wrinkles web her tired face. My mother is creased with a tradition that is heavy to carry. So she has a broad back and sturdy arms, thick legs to carry on. Because how else would we cross the threshold with our children on our backs to teach, teach them not to be laden by the thickness of a blizzard cold past? Okay, that was my first poem. <laughs> Woo! <That's> my mother. <laughs> The second poem is entitled Grandma. Grandma wears a brooch, a turquoise beater, beetle that rests on her collar. It lulls when she falls asleep. Grandma's eyes are milky white. Her hair hangs over her face, cobwebs, cobwebs filled with silver strands of our history. Grandma's face is sun spotted. Dark marks claiming a stake on her face, just like they did to her land. Grandma's finger is continually pricked. The bald finger riddled with needle holes. She still loves fried chicken. Grandma rests in the earth, leaving a world that never claimed her as its own. Backwards tradition left in the midst of unsettled dust. And this is my last poem, Putty Faced Baby. A puffy snowsuit overwhelms my chubby frame. Thick snow blankets the back of the truck. I am too. My eyes peer past the chub of my cheeks. I share an innocent gaze with the camera. Putty faced baby molded by the hands of circumstance. I didn't, I know nothing about you, mother. I didn't know that he had come in under the cloak of the night, dried eager, eager hands on you like you were a towel and wrung you until you were dry. I didn't know. You'd tell me on my sixth birthday and I would watch as smoke smoldered, fueled by the stub, melted stubs of candles, wax hardening on my cake. Wow. Was that awesome or what? Yeah. yeah. So that was our uh, first place winners, grad and undergrad, and uh, again, some of our first place winners in that grad division were also second place winners in other categories. So, um, so right on to all you folks for leading the charge this year. Um, up next for us are our second and third place winners. Um, we're going to hear from our uh, grads first. That'll be Marianne Witterberg, Jesse Betts, and Angela Turnbow, uh, Lori Lee. And then um, we'll have our undergrads, Alex Erickson, Leela Richardson, Nacelle Contreras, Laurel Frank, Millie Tullis, and Isaac Tim. And um, just want to remind you guys when you come up uh, to say your name and the title of your work. And again, let people know if it's fiction or nonfiction. Let them guess if it's a poem. <laughs> and uh, my title of my piece is Burial Ground, and it is nonfiction. 
And just a couple of things before I start, because um, I'm kind of starting in the middle. So this piece is about cemeteries. Surprise, it's called Burial Ground. Um, and a couple, so one thing you probably want to know is I have 13 siblings, um, and I'm the oldest, but at this time of this piece, or not when it was written, but at the time it was in this piece, I only had 11. So you'll hear 11, that's because I have 11 siblings. So March 27, 2006. The breeze plays to the top of lo a lone poplar. Leaves rustle, a thousand tongues whispering a message I do not understand. <laughs> I want to believe it's from, from my brother, Jacob, who lies in the polished blue casket trimmed in fleur de lis. I'd much rather hear from him than from the wrinkled man speaking words over a gaping hole in the ground. Jacob couldn't have known that the last thing he would say to me would be, algebra is stupid. I've been trying to help Jacob with his math homework the morning before he died. See, I'd said, you have to do the same thing to both sides of the equation. I don't care, he said. You're never going to do, get anywhere in life if you don't learn this. I don't need this stuff. Algebra is stupid. Fine. I slammed his pencil down on the kitchen table, breaking the point and gouging the vinyl covering. I never talked to my brother again. <coughs> the sun shouldn't be so bright today. The movies never portray it like this. Funerals happen under black umbrellas, rain giving the eulogy. The attendees shiver under their dark shelters, watch the rain drip down the canopies. Only a light breeze causes me to pull my arms close to my chest. Today is any other spring day. The breeze carries the smell of cut grass and freshly turned soil. People wander among headstones, leaving the first chrysanthemums of the season as Jacob's services conclude. My brother Jared and four of my cousins lower Jacob's casket into the ground. I cup my hands over my ears when they release the handles. Jared pulls a green canvas cover over the grave, and our solemn party turns to chattering. <coughs> I'm still listening to the tree, but I make out nothing over the conversations growing around me. Isn't it wonderful that today could be so beautiful for Jacob? A woman from our congregation says to mom. Spring came the day Jacob died two months early for Idaho. When I got home from school, I lingered on the back porch and stretched my arms out at my sides, face up turned toward the sun. I shuffled inside only when Mom told me to set the table for dinner. We didn't notice anything unusual until we called the family. Jacob was always one of the first to arrive. Like most teenage boys, dinner was his favorite time of the day. We waited five minutes, then ten. Maybe we better look for him, Mom said. He's probably outside somewhere. Eleven pairs of legs rushed in eleven directions, but Jacob wasn't enjoying the early spring. He was lying in my parents' master bathroom below the shelf where my dad kept his guns. The sheriff said we found Jacob right after he dropped the rifle he was either taking down or putting away, but the search took hours. I think it's still going on. When the crowd surrounding my brother's grave thins to scattered clumps of hushed conversation, I stroll to the poplar and place my palm on its smooth trunk. I rest my forehead against the lowest branch and close my eyes. Beneath squirrel's chatter and crow's calls, the leaves hum. I imagine Jacob standing beside me, his hand on the opposite side of the trunk. And despite the conversing groups who think my brother's funeral is a social event, despite the inappropriate weather, despite the excavator waiting like a vulture just outside the cemetery, I think I hear Jacob's voice through the leaves. I was right, Miriam, it says. Algebra is stupid. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessie Betts, and I'm going to be reading from my fiction piece called Albatross. Sam sat on the back porch of the beach house he had rented for the weekend in Oceanside waiting for Victoria and Tommy to arrive. Even this early in the morning, he could hear the city waking up behind him, which could work in his favor. He hoped he might be able to convince Victoria to move up there so he wouldn't have to commute to work anymore, and she loved city noise. It would be a hard sell. Victoria taught biology at San Diego University, and why should she have to commute to work? She had the higher paying job while Sam was only an adjunct at Maricosta College in Oceanside. It was more than the commute though. 
He tired of San Diego, the ever alive city. No moment when everything was still or at peace. The looming buildings, the throbbing skyline, jeweled windows glittering like facets of a schizophrenic diamond. It stifled. He finally understood what Victoria meant all those years ago when she said she didn't belong in Idaho Falls. He did not belong in San Diego. He would need more than that abstract flim-flam to convince Victoria, though. San Diego was her domain, and she looked good in it. A bright carriage, slim frame with sharp hip and collarbones, green coffee thermos perpetually in hand. A city girl through and through. He hoped that for the first time in their 19-year partnership, they would be able to compromise. Oceanside seemed a perfect compromise to him, the feel of San Diego on a much smaller scale. Though, even if Sam somehow conceded, succeeded in convincing her to move 45 minutes from her vibrant work and social life in San Diego, he still had no idea what he would say to their 16-year-old son, Tommy. One problem at a time. Victoria and Tommy finally arrived, and after greetings and breakfast, they walked down to the beach. Sam hoped his family would notice how this beach compared to San Diego beaches as cleaner, emptier, quieter and that somehow that would be considered a good thing to them. But with Victoria armed with her high-tech bird-watching binoculars and Tommy with his surfboard, Sam didn't think it likely they would notice much else. Sure enough, Victoria immediately posed the binoculars a half inch from her eyes and scanned the sky over the water. Tommy plunged through the surf and paddled to the brakes. He looked impressive on his board, centered, as the waves crashed around him. His tense muscles somehow held his body on a thin piece of fiberglass when a much greater power tried to rip them apart. Sam tried to decide what restaurant might impress Victoria and Tommy, but he couldn't get the noise of the ocean out of his ears. Sammy, Victoria called, look! She thrust the binoculars into his hands and pointed into the sky. He put the binocular cord around his neck so he wouldn't drop them in the sand and pressed the rubber rims to his eyes. He tried to find what she wanted him to see, but he couldn't seem to coordinate the tiny speck in the sky with the magnified lenses. Before long, Victoria impatiently came up behind him, right hand on his shoulder, left hand guiding the binoculars. She stood a few inches taller than him, and he suddenly felt like a child under her touch. See? Right there, she breathed into his hair. Finally, he saw it, a bird, the color of soot, floating on air. An albatross, Victoria sighed. Before he thought about it, Sam recited, At length did cross an albatross, through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, we held it in God's name. He had recently read the rhyme of the ancient mariner and fell in love with the precise rhymes and rhythm. He knew exactly what to expect next. Victoria gazed at him with one cocked eyebrow as if she had never come across a creature such as him. Or, on second thought, the same way she regarded her students' indecipherable assignments. Sam let the binoculars fall to rest around his neck. They were heavier than he expected them to be. Thank you. and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my nonfiction piece entitled Becoming a Savior. And just to give you a little background, this, is, um, this piece um, kind of gives a few pictures of the experiences I had while working as a CNA at a nursing home here in Logan. Um, so, there it is. The honking car horns left a lingering tension in the air. An entire acre of land separated the nursing home from the busy street where the hospital resided yet the frantic rush of traffic permeated the area. The heavy weight of my tired limbs had not abated since waking up that morning, but George wanted a walk before dinner, so I consented. It was a habit for him to take a walk in the afternoon, and normally I enjoyed it. After a few turns inside the building, I stepped outside into the hot, noisy afternoon air with George and Derek, my CNA in training in tow. George, a solid and severe-looking man, was the kind of person who would never hurt anyone. His warm, gentle manner endeared him to others. He transferred to the facility during midsummer to recuperate from a bad case of pneumonia. 
We walked down the slope of the Medicare entrance together, equipped with a walker and a gate belt fastened around his waist, but that still didn't prevent the fall from occurring. George tripped over his own feet, and there was no other logical option. He needed a clean fall. He teetered back and forth and must have wondered why I didn't reach out to him. I forced myself to take a step back and let it happen. He looked me in the eyes before I felt the rush of his body give way to gravity. Fear and confusion reflected in his face, and I knew the question he asked of me without any word spoken. Why won't you help me? And my response, I am. You just don't know it. There's a set procedure in place that every aide must learn to certify as a nurse's assistant. These procedures protect not only the resident, but the aide. My training taught that if a resident was going to fall, the best option is to give the resident as clean a fall as possible. The fewer the barriers in the way, the less damaging the injuries. And my body was a barrier in George's fall. The possibility of him sustaining injuries from my prevention was too great, so the books told me to step back and protect myself. I could get hurt, and that would not help anyone. Not me, not the residents, and not my colleagues. We all rely on each other to help care for the residents on these two-person transfers. An aide can't help out if she suffers from a cold muscle or a strained back. I remember Kelly. Two weeks ago, she walked up to me as the afternoon shift began. I have a doctor's note for no lifting. Why? What happened? Hoping that concern sounded in my voice. But really, I was annoyed. Her doctor's note was going to make the shift long and tiring and not easy on anyone. Lorraine had a fall the other day while being transferred, and I hurt myself trying to prevent it, she explained. Well, what went wrong with the transfer, I continued. Her legs gave out, and it caught us off guard. We ended up sliding her to the ground. But I won't allow a resident to fall on my watch, so I still held on to her and hurt my back in the process, she said. Her idea of help was so different than mine. We worked at the same nursing facility together for three years, and yet her actions suggested she did not believe in the procedures. A few days after our conversation, Kelly came in to work to notify the staff of her leave of absence. Her doctor found extensive damage in her back, and she needed time to recover from the injury. She stepped forward to help the rain, and yet in the end, it cost her. My reaction to a fall was automatic. It made sense <clears throat> to follow textbook training. No harm done to myself. But as I stood before George in his post-fall state, I felt the need for a leave of absence as well. We congregated around the nurse's station, reflecting on the last busy hour. The aides, wanting to know George's prognosis, pestered the nurse with questions. One turned to me and asked how I was feeling. Shock registered on my face. Not once did it occur to me that someone would be thinking of me when someone else had fallen. No one ever asked such a question before the previous accidents at work. The silence settled in around the aides as they waited for my response. My name is Lori Lee, and this is poetry, but it's sprinkled with fiction and nonfiction. <laughs> The first one is called Enough Already, and since it's the end of the semester, I'll let some of you come to it. <laughs> I swear, I am no more tired than an angel who has danced forever in her stocking feet. And I am no more tired than a child carried by his father from the car, shoes, socks, carefully removed, his body curling completely to his dreams. And I am no more tired than any woman after days of chasing minutes and years, never to catch them, but somehow to hold them in those bags on her hips. And I am no more tired than life, with all its lazy dogs flopped in the shade, panting out their exhaustion, jowls flagging. <laughs> The next one is called Prayers. In the medial, she raises her voice and says, Jesus, I need a special on pork chops. <laughs> <laughs> she just wants help, a sign that someone listens. 
Like taxes, men and their sex, impatient mothers, some things just are. She is. With pomegranate lipstick, lips slick with red number nine, she is us. There is no such thing as normal people. Pray, brothers, sisters, daughters, parents. Pray for the longevity of the astroturf. Pray for the wicked on fire in their own self-loathing. Pray for moisture. Pray for pomegranate red number nine. Pray for love and money. Pray for pork chops. Pray like your life depends on it. one is called Foreign Music or More Than One Way to Say a Thing. And this comes from um, a few years ago. I was at a writing residency back in Vermont. And those that were attendees at, this, at the residency location were from all over the world. So there were artists and writers. And we only saw each other mealtimes because during the rest of the time we were in our studios either writing or working on whatever art we were doing and we'd get together at Mills. And so this is about an exchange that went on. And um, forgive my attempt to capture the, um, the accent. <laughs> he looks over us and in broken English says, you three always together, a trio, you know, three instruments, music. A quartet is better, and he sits at our table. <laughs> <laughs> the next day at lunch, he admits he does not play an instrument. He says he will conduct. Uneasy, with his quick rise to power, I mumble, in your dreams. <laughs> you know Bach, he says on day three. Then something about how the genius could take liberties. A particular piece hums from his lips, and I nod yes, though I have no idea. He nods. We eat in silence. <laughs> On day four, he tells me he likes my watch. And I thank him. Place my arm in my lap. <laughs> you know why I don't tell you I like you, he says. Because if I do, you hide just like you now hide your watch. <laughs> he smiles with the wind of a laugh, his eyes like stage fright. Or maybe that was me, and his eyes were conducting. <laughs> Alright, my name is Alex Erickson. Um, I'll be reading from my fiction piece called The High One. The bush plane slid to a stop on the crusty late November snow near a freezing lake in the western part of the Alaska Range. Carl stepped down in his lime green parka and pulled his pack out. Robert handed his own pack to Carl and stepped out after. The pilot cut the engine and opened the cockpit window. Last chance, he said. You guys sure about this? Of course we're sure, Carl said. He'll be seeing us at the West Rib within a week. The pilot looked at Robert who nodded with forced confidence. He had been backpacking before, had spent 10 days in the Bob Marshall Wilderness last summer and four days in the Wind Rivers the January before it, but had nowhere near the experience Carl had. Not with an undertaking like this. Small amounts of daylight, the likelihood of extreme cold, this was new. The pilot started the engine, gave a quick salute, brought the plane around, throttled up, took off, and banked toward the coming sun. After checking that their snowshoes and other gear were secured to their packs, they pulled the straps up over their shoulders. So, Carl grinned through his red beard and pulled his watch cap down over his ears. You sure about this? Past midday, Carl sat on a rock, planted his ice axe in the, in the old snow like a flag, and pulled out the map. Robert remained on his feet a few yards away, bent at the waist and sucking in breaths. He straightened and gulped from his canteen. They had been climbing for the better part of three hours along the ridge to the pass, but not before two more hours of negotiating woods and hills of the valley they landed in. It's still 45 minutes to Tal or still 40 miles to Talkeetna as the crow flies, Carl said, and marked an X on the map before he folded it and stuffed it back into a side pocket on his pack. 
and then you can call that dear Karen of yours. Robert forced a single laugh. I guess so. She'd probably kill me if I didn't. What's that now? You aren't just, you aren't going to be just dying to call your old lady? You two, uh, Carl began adjusting the crampon on his right boot. You two doing all right? Yeah, Robert said, suddenly feeling the spotlight. He sat down on a nearby rock to appear comfortable. Same old, same old. I don't know how you can handle it, man. Carl shook his head. Not Karen. I don't really know her. I mean, having a girlfriend in general. Robert laughed genuinely this time. Not so sure I do handle it. Then I'll jump ahead to uh, later in the story here. The next morning, he woke hours before the sun, breathing out smoke with his face numb and his body aching. He opened the door to the tent and sh shook his head. Of course. Fresh snow had fallen in the night. Robert pressed his hand through it till he felt the ground, about six inches. Great. He sat for a while and then pulled on his parka, pants, and boots and stepped outside. He scanned his campsite with the flashlight, but when he thought about it, he didn't know why. It's not like he would have noticed any differences, what the state he was in when he settled here. He did see, however, a small bump where the fire had been. He untied one end of the rope he had run over the branches of two trees to hang his pack and lowered the pack to the ground. He brushed off the snow and rummaged inside for some food. He trudged about 50 yards until the trees opened up to a view of a long valley extending north and south. He turned off the flashlight and pulled a piece of jerky from his pocket and bit off a chunk. As he chewed, he wondered at the majesty of what he saw. The stars and moon lit mounds and troughs, peppered with patches of frosted cones and spindles, all shapes rudimentary. Despite the new hell it brought with it, the snow had an equalizing effect on the world, a death mask hiding from him all the scars and truths of the land. And through the clear sky, beyond the lower mountains across the valley, the summit of Denali ever faintly present. That's what I got. Mm -hmm. My name's Leela Richardson, and I'm reading from a piece called Floating and Falling. It's a nonfiction piece about learning to swim. And it kind of jumps between my experiences when I was younger and when I'm older. Um, so follow along with me. There are a couple different scenes in what I'm reading. The monster in the closet had never scared me like the one underwater. I'd been six, and although I hadn't known it yet, he'd been lurking in a bar backyard pool. While I'd sat on a floating chair, he'd been the green reflected on the floor under my inflated plastic. His ragged breaths were waves rocking my throne back and forth like a soothing cradle. I laughed and joked with my friends, unaware of his lurking. Light played over the water, reflecting shifting shapes and shadows, beautiful against the blue surface. It was just a joke that landed me in those teeth the first time. A friend tipped the chair, not realizing that it had crept too far in the deep end for me to stand on the bottom not knowing that since I hadn't yet learned to swim, I would rest on the bottom either way. Blue stretched out before my eyes, my earth and my sky. There was no monster in the water. The monster was the water. That's the first time the water had deafened me to the screaming, but it hadn't been mine. My sister and my mother had yelled, Leela can't swim! I'd been scooped out of the water before, the skin would, before my skin would be wrinkled by the chlorinate saliva. He hadn't taken me then, but he'd gotten a taste. And forever after, I was like Hook with his crocodile. I knew out there in the water, something craved me. Leels? His baritone voice broke through the panic like fog around me. My eyes found the green anchor again, and it was right across from me. It was all right. It was all right. I didn't need to hold on to him like I would the wall. He would come after me if I sink. My arm stroked over my head more easily this time, and then hit smooth tile. Don't run into the wall, he chuckled. From out of my lips crept a laugh I hadn't realized was there, and my breathing evened out around the comforting sound. Whoops. I let my feet catch up to me so they were moving like a frog beneath me, just how he'd explained. I bobbed in the water and my arms circled around like stirring two potions, one that had to turn clockwise and one that just as certainly must be counterclockwise. That was good. How do you feel? I feel good. My head bobbed up and down. Let's try floating. My body doesn't float. My body sinks. He eyed my leopard suit itself and laughed. 
I think your body will float just fine. But if it will make you feel better, you can float on my hand. Here, lean back. He came up behind me and took my shoulders, guiding them back against his chest while moving out of the way, so I never touched more than his palm in the small of my back. It was a pseudo-trust fall, and he was stepping out of the way, letting my back and shoulders, head, and even ears sink into the water. I walked with my big sisters through our neighbor's fence and into their backyard. What's this lady's name? I asked in a quick whisper, gripping my princess towel around my waist. Nailin? Newland, Catherine corrected. The pool was a coliseum of water, sticking up from the ground with the foe that had nearly destroyed me last time waiting inside. As I descended into the arena and negotiating each step down the ladder with care, I realized that my foe was shorter this time. The water didn't even reach my shoulders. I was taller than him. I smiled. The first thing we had learned at our neighborhood swim lesson was to float. I watched everyone lean into the water, magically floating over the top like feathers, and did a simple calculation. If I lay down, I would be once again shorter than my opponent. Here, let me help you, the new labor said, standing at my side and putting her pudgy hand against my back. She pushed me back with the other, like a baptism, which would scare me two years later. Stay straight, she encouraged, and I was astonished when my body skimmed the surface of the water, resting all the weight my father now called too heavy for shoulder rides. <laughs> You're doing great. But then she moved her hand, and I wasn't. I lifted my head startled, and my body sank into the water like the enchantment had broken. Her hand caught my lower back and pushed it up again. Stay straight. You moved your hand. I informed her, wondering why she hadn't realized the reason for my fall was her and not me. It's all right, your body is mostly made of water and fat, so you'll float. <laughs> I wanted to make a joke to my sister. Did she just say that I'm fat? But then she moved her hand again. <laughs> my head began to rise from the water, but her words kept me off. You're all right, I've got my hand under you, it's just not touching you. I rested my head back against my waterbed. The sun was rising in the sky, resting in my eyes. I closed them, letting the heat work against my eyelids and dry my face, trying to relax. It seemed that several minutes passed before I opened my eyes again. Neighbor Newland was gone. My head jolted up as my pivot plummeted down. Like a V, I plunged into the water, stumbling to get my feet under me. My head fell below the surface for just a moment, tasting a hint of chlorine, and then I was on my feet again, affronted by a strange, unpleasant flooding in my nose. The water must have gotten in a few good punches, one to my gut, the other to my nostril. A tear mingled with pool water in my eye. It hurt. I climbed out of the pool, calling a draw, and I never returned. I would have made a very bad run. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Laurel Frank, and I'm going to be reading my fiction piece. I need this one. Weirdest things found in stiffs. <laughs> the sharp scent of disinfectant mostly overwhelmed the sickly undertone in the room as Eli Park adjusted the bright white lights overhead. He spread a surgical drape over the inert face of the young woman lying unclothed on the cold metal table. Her body arched slightly over the block propped under the small of her back. Eli crossed to one of the black cabinets that lined the sterile white walls and withdrew several silvery instruments on a tray, including a scalpel, which he lifted in one of his turquoise gloved hands. Face scrunched in concentration behind his rectangle framed glasses, he made the first incision. The scalpel slid easily through flesh as Eli carefully sliced from each shoulder in a V to the bottom of the breastbone. From the tip of the V, he drew another line straight down the center of the soft abdomen, rounding the navel and ending at the pubic bone, splitting the skin and tissue in a shallow canyon along the incision. Where's that? Eli asked, glancing up at Dr. Ramiro Flores, who stood on the other side of the room. Before Ramiro could answer, the cream-colored swinging door squeaked open as Dr. Thad Shipper entered, as though summoned by mention of his name. He crossed the room half-skipping, his footsteps tapping on the off-white linoleum floor. Thad was only a few years older than Eli, perhaps 34 or 35. He was almost as tall as Eli, though not quite as lanky. His blonde, slick, combed hair, currently covered with a surgical cap, and symmetrical, aristocratic features hinted at erudite sophistication. When Eli first met him, however, it had taken about five minutes before the young doctor's behavior thoroughly disproved any such assumptions. I got it, that's what Thad said, pulling up his surgical mask. 
He took the scalpel in his own gloved hand and, pre and proceeded to make ninja sword sound effects with his mouth as he hacked through the connective tissue between the chest flap and the ribs, peeling the V up to expose the sternum, front ribs, and sinewy neck meat. Having fun, Eli said, yep. More sound effects, unpleasant squishing ones, ensued as Thad gripped the edge of the flesh firmly at the belly, stretching it upward. As he slit the remaining tissue to expose the organs, the swollen, swollen intestine bul bulged out of the incision. Quit it. You're distracting, said Ramira, <laughs> raising one thin black eyebrow. She stood across the room over a similar setup, a second fully gutted body splayed before her on a second metal table. Quit what, Remy, Thad said, looking up at her briefly with an innocent expression, before turning back to the body and separating the rest of the skin, fat, and muscle from the ribcage inside with more ninja sword sound effects, then flapping the breast and attached flap to either side so that the abdominal cavity and ribcage lay completely exposed. Seriously, how old are you, Ramira said, <laughs> shaking her head, her voice stern, but her pretty dark eyes strained at the corners from resisting the urge to laugh. Eli looked away from her and instinctively took a half step away from Thad as he gestured vaguely with the scalpel. <laughs> Irrelevant, said Thad, setting the blade back on the tray. He extended his hand expectantly toward Eli. Loppers, Eli sighed and handed Thad the heavy shears. There was no need for Thad to make his own sound effects as he clipped through the rib cage with several loud clacks. <laughs> the coiled bowels wobbled like misshapen jello with the motion of each sharp snap. After helping Thad remove the chest plate, Eli moved the white plastic trays from the counter onto the edge of the table within Thad's reach. Thad flippantly but precisely cut free the heart, then the left lung, then the right. Before long, the two of them had removed most of the upper innards from the cavity, and Thad was reaching from inside the empty chest to free the neck organs and tongue. I'm going to go out on a limb here, said Eli as Thad squinted and probed with the scalpel, and say that the cause of death had something to do with that whatever that is that's obstructing the trachea, Thad finished. At length, he removed the object. He closed his eyes in a solemn expression. Eli the list. Eli obediently stood and crossed the room, pulling off his plastic gloves as he neared a simple wooden desk, um, sorry, the surface of which was hidden by stacks of paperwork. Remy, come here, Thad said. Ramir sighed and complied, bending over the object in question. What is... is that a dreidel? Thad laughed, and Eli grinned as he turned to the poster board pinned to the wall above the, the desk, the heading of which read, Weirdest Things Found in Stiffs, in Thad's careless all-capitals hand. Uncapping a black sharpie, Eli neatly printed dreidel under mechanical pencil, partially inflated helium balloon, and in Thad's hand, M-I-D, no, M-E-D, medieval lance head. Was she trying to eat it? Ramira wondered aloud. Somebody had too much fun at Kwanzaa, Thad said, picking up the clay spinning top and giving it a twirl on the tray. Ramira stared at him. You mean Hanukkah? Thank you. <laughs> My name is Millie Tullis, and I got third place for undergraduate nonfiction. Um, the title of my essay is Flesh Memories. Um, basically, all that's literally happening is I'm walking through a cemetery. So, we're going to just start there. I don't know this grave. I hold no personal claim on it. I just stopped. Now I am stooping before it close enough I could reach out and touch it. As the thought occurs to me, I do it, but I sense that I am an intruder for the first time when the solid, rough rock hits my finger's pads. I drop my hand ashamed and use both hands to clutch my notebook again instead. Babies of Myrtle and John Young, 1919. The words are small, resting in careful print on a small, careful headstone. It was on the left side of the road when I had been walking, and the word babies had stopped me. The babies might have grown into two little girls who held hands, and walked into the first day of kindergarten together. They might have been best friends, reading books aloud to each other at night, in matching twin-sized beds set parallel in a brightly painted bedroom like my sister and me. They might have had teenage boys who wanted to hold them, shivering in the back of parents' borrowed cars, boys who kissed their cheeks and faces whispering I love you through heavy breaths. They might have been mothers or doctors or lawyers or writers. The stone yields nothing else to me but I stare. Maybe to every parent, your child is always your baby, too. 
Maybe to your heart, a middle-aged, balding son can't ever be fully separated from the pale, gently breathing bundle that a nurse placed in the natural nook of your arm at that first introduction. His face came from something that was pink and shiny and new and bright. It will always be holding in it that which you see as new and bright, a baby's life, potential, start. Perhaps it will always seem to be the baby that needed you, and you'll never escape from that striking terror that you need him now too. My mother and brother call my two younger sisters and me the babies. They have since my youngest sister was born, all three of us only four years apart. I'm 18 years old today. They'll call me one of the babies until the day I die. My heels are thick, but they sunk into the, grass the grassy earth before the grave when I first crouched. It hadn't rained that day. October still left a little dampness in the grass and dirt, and it was soft. My heels punctured it too quickly. I wondered how many tears had nourished the small piece of earth below me, the dirt, the grave I was now sinking into, and how many other tears for this grave had been washed away somewhere else. Perhaps there had been a mother wiping her wetted face quickly on the arm of her sleeve, stretching it out past her thin wrist, her knees bending together and meeting for her elbows to sink into, her back arched. She sat on the lid of a bathroom toilet with the fan going to cover up the trembling, crying sounds she couldn't seem to stop. Perhaps just outside was the bedroom where the father had held his face in large hands and wept like a child, sitting on the edge of a sinking bed in a buttoned white shirt and dark tie, waiting for his wife to finish getting ready. Only after the tears had been stuffed away could they slip on their dry masks again, hiding the scars crying left on their cheeks to go dancing with a neighbor couple. Perhaps they had both cried where my shoes sink now for the babies sleeping beneath my feet. There aren't any tears now. I'm alone before the stone. All of the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, all of the John and Myrtle Youngs probably nod at papers holding family birth and death certificates dry eye. Stacks of my own family's souls sit in my parents' house. They sit in the same way in the houses of my aunts and uncles. They lie in binders and books as projects. The aunts and uncles had made the books themselves. The pages are cracked open to find a picture, a birthday, or a name for a school assignment. Then their lives are closed again. Like the loose leaf papers, they are bound together by rings and put in a stack in a corner. The ghosts, kisses, and accomplishments and babies sink lower and deeper under the stacks as years pass. The papers are brittle and dry. I stand and begin to walk again. My legs and body feel lighter. The grave leaves me feeling afraid or guilty. I had no right to be sad for the dead babies. What do I know of dying or last breaths taken or breaths that were never taken at all? I don't even know the broken mother. I've never bled like her or cried from losing flesh I grew. Sweat. I've never sweated, never passed a starting sweetness, a sticky shine, a young dew, and all my bones are whole. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, this is, I'm only going to be reading one of the three poems I, I wrote for the contest. Uh, this is kind of the poem that Logan wrote. I wrote this in Michael Souter's class. Well, actually, no, I wrote it at the Utah League of Writers. We were having our workshop, our weekly workshop, and I wrote, I wanted to write a poem with the word posi traction in it because I thought it was really, really cool. And so I wrote this poem. And uh, I took it through my writer's group, and then I took it through Michael Souter's class. And basically, um, on the surface, it's a poem about a boy pursuing a girl. But deeper down, it's about a boy dealing with a mother with bipolar disorder, and about how fast the manic highs could go to catatonic depressions and how you feel responsible for that even though there is nothing really you can do about it. 
This is the girl from Las Vegas drives away. You peel out full posi traction, roaring away a white teardrop Chevy to lozenge at the vanishing point. You leave me behind to swallow the words I meant to say. You're a dead ringer for my mother, for her distance. Mother, I love you, don't go away. She went deep into your head, into her head. You pass between Joshua trees, a blur. I have nothing left but illusions. How I hate you, me struck dumb in the sun, naked under the phosphorescent bulb, the roar of your engine, a fading, ringing buzz. Great. That was awesome. What a yeah. lot of stuff we've just gone through. It's like a whole compendium of life tonight, right? And uh, I think that's what's so amazing to me every year. And, uh, you know, especially this year, the range of things that uh, everyone's writing about. Um, I've had several of the judges come to me and say, you know, the things that people were trying this year were so much more complicated, so much more sophisticated than they've ever seen before. And I think that's true. I think our writers and our little Logan writing community just keep getting better, just keep getting sharper, just keep getting deeper. And uh, I'm really glad to be a part of it. I'm glad you guys are a part of it, too. Um, I want to just, uh, for one quick moment, just to uh, point out that what we've been enjoying on the screen here ever so dimly is the artwork of uh, our winner, Wan Jun Han, uh, Win uh, Maria Williams, um, Wan Jun Han won first and third place by the way, uh, Christine Jackson, Brian Strain, Laurel Frank who was one of our readers as well, and uh, Sarah Timmerman and Angela Turnbow who is also one of our um, nonfiction winners. So um, please do get a magazine, check these pictures out. Uh, where you can really see how beautiful they are. If, um, you know, I don't want to cut my sales or anything, but if you don't happen to have $10, the magazine will eventually be available online from the English Department website. You can get a, a PDF version of it and view it that way. Um, but, you know, what you really want is this thing that well, you can hold in your hands and look at and remember yeah. and share with everybody else you know. So. Uh, Please uh, pick up a magazine if you, um, if you can. Uh, go back there. It looks like there's still lots of cookies, lots to drink. Um, please just hang out, mingle, talk to the writers, get their autographs, make them feel famous. <laughs> um, a big round of applause for everyone tonight.